Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Embrace. If no one has said good morning to you yet, then consider this your personal greeting. So glad that you're with us here in the Embrace family today. We're going to get started with worship together this morning, but before we do, just want to let you know that we would love to get to know you and to hear from you if there's anything that you would like to share. There are Connect cards in your pew. They are these nice, bright blue card. And if you would like to share your information with us or get on our email list or ask about small groups or volunteer opportunities, these are great ways to communicate with us. You can also give us prayer requests. If there's anything that you're kind of carrying this morning that you would like to have someone else carry with you, we'd love to pray together here at Embrace. We have a team that keeps those requests confidential. So you can fill that out. If you want to fill out a Connect card, you can put it in one of the boxes at the back or the side. That's also where you can put a contribution if you would like to give while you're here this morning. You can also always give online at embraceyourcity.com give. There are also announcement handouts at the welcome tables, so if you didn't grab one on the way in, feel free to grab one on the way out. It has all the exciting information about things happening here, like a book study starting next week, so good things going on. But as we get started in worship this morning, I invite you just to take a deep breath and find a center and allow the Lord to really meet you this morning in this place. With me this morning, and we're going to begin by reading our call to worship for today, and we're going to move into beginning just by praising God and, and, and lifting up God's name. So let's say this together. Oh Lord, let my soul rise up to meet you as the day rises to meet the sun. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. can separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ. So let us in freedom confess the wrong that we have done. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to continue to worship uh, just by singing about the goodness of God. Because God is uh, so good. And there's a lot of things in our world right now that are kind of stressing me out. <laughs> um, and you may feel the same way. It often feels overwhelming just to see the immense amount of suffering and pain that is all around us at all times. And I have to remind myself often through singing uh, that we have a really good God. And a good God that I believe has a plan, even though it's hard to see it sometimes, um, but God has a plan. And God is, is moving and working in this world, that God's eternal spirit is moving and working all around us and even through us and in us to bring about the redemption of this world. And so my prayer this morning is that we could have eyes to see, that we could borrow the eyes of God and be able to see things the way God does. That we could have eyes to see God's goodness um, this morning, even when it's hard to see sometimes. And so um, hopefully these songs can be an encouragement to you. And if you're having a hard time believing the words you're singing, then sometimes we sing them into belief in a way, you know, and we remind ourselves of these truths um, that that we've been singing about for uh, many, many years now. So this, uh, this song we're going to sing is called The Goodness of God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All of my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up, Till I lay my head And I will sing Of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest night, you were close like no other. I've known you as a father.
Good morning. It is really good to be together today, and my hope is that you've already experienced God's presence, that you already feel and can sense the Holy Spirit um, moving throughout this space, moving in our hearts. Um, it's, it's almost like the air we breathe. You know, we often breathe to remind ourselves that God is with us. God is sustaining us. God is with us on this journey. And so uh, I just pray that you continue to open yourself up to hear from God today. Uh, my name is John, and I'm the lead pastor here at the church. I just want to say welcome to each and every one of you. If you're visiting with us this morning, I want to say a special welcome to you. And just let us know if you need anything or would like to uh, meet with any of us to learn more about our church. Um, today is a, a special day. Um, we did one of these a couple of weeks ago, and I'm excited to do another today. Um, but we have uh, someone in our church who is going to get baptized. And so I'm going to go ahead and invite uh, Jonathan and Katie Grabo, and they're going to bring their son James up as well. So everybody, come on up. Let's give them a hand as they come to the front. Katie's father, Ron, is coming up as well. He is a minister, and he is going to uh, assist and participate um, in this baptism as well this morning because um, he wanted to be able to be involved in that um, in the life of his grandson, which I think is great. And so we did one of these a couple weeks ago, and it was very special and very powerful, and I'm just so excited to have another baptism today. This is a sign. This is a, a symbol of God's um, just desire and love for us, God's pursuit of his children. Um, it's a beautiful reminder of the, the God's power to bring new life into places of death. And all around us, we see a lot of suffering and pain. We see a lot of death and violence. And I love that we can pause for a moment to celebrate life and to celebrate something beautiful and something good, to remind ourselves that God is still at work in this world. Um, some people come to our church, and they don't often understand why we baptize babies, because they don't do that in all traditions, um, and that's okay. I respect uh, both uh, opinions on the matter, but we, we baptize babies here because we believe that it's really ultimately about God's grace. Like, we do nothing to earn the salvation that God gives us, and I think baptism of babies is a wonderful sign of the fact that God loved us and chose us and pursued us before we even knew we needed it. And God is working in James's life now, even though he doesn't fully understand it. God is there loving him and showing love and kindness and grace to him, even in this moment right now that we are gathered here today. And so we're going to move through a baptism service this morning. There will be parts that you all will say, uh, which will be in yellow, and it will say all. And so um, you all say those parts, and I will say the parts that say leader. And so we're going to move through this together. So brothers and sisters in Christ... Through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. And all of this is God's gift offered to us without price. And so this morning, I present for baptism James Daniel Grabo, son of Jonathan and Katie Grabo. And so I have a few questions I'm going to ask the two of you, and if you agree, uh, these first Three or I do. All right, so it's very simple. So the first one, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers in this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to re resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? 
This next one you can answer, I will, if you agree. Will you nurture James in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, he will be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly and lead a Christian life? All right, Embrace, I have a, a couple of questions to ask you. This first one's very simple. You'll just say, we do, if you agree. Do you, as Christ's body, embrace church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? So there's a bit longer, so you can read it on the screen. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this child now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround this child with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. So let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So I'm going to pray a prayer that you all are going to join with me, and there will be parts that you will pray that will be in yellow, and you can say those when that part comes. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and he who receives it to wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness through his life that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. All right, I'm going to invite Brother Ron to come on over. He's going to do this baptism. Good morning. My name is Ron, and my wife, Doreen, is out there. And along with uh, Larry and Mary Jo Grabo, we, we share this little grandson. And so that makes it a special joy today to be able to participate. And more than anything, uh, as your pastor has said, to be chosen among all people, to be able to be sign bearers that Christ is always good and his grace is sufficient for all people. And remember... Christ always and at all times expressly gave special permission to allow the little children to come. And so today we participate in that joy of grace. the Holy Spirit within you keep you 
guide you, and forever establish you as a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. James did great. So members of the household of faith, I commend to your love and care James Daniel Grabo, whom we this day recognize as a member of the family of God. Will you endeavor so to live that this child may grow in the knowledge and love of God through our Savior, Jesus Christ? With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that this child, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Amen. All right, let's give him another hand and welcome him into our church family. All right, y'all may have a seat. So now uh, we are going to dismiss our children for their time of learning in the Wonder Room. And so let's give our kids a hand as they come up. If you are a parent and you have brought a child with you today and they've never gone to the Wonder Room, then if they are four years old, all the way up through fifth grade in school, then they are welcome to join. And I would ask that you walk up with them for the first time and make sure all the proper paperwork is filled out and you know what's going on. Um, but uh, we'll have some leaders up there that will greet you if you are new this morning. We'll give them a chance to head out. And then I do have one quick announcement I want to share with you before we move into a time of prayer. So as the kids are, hand, are heading out, I wanted to remind you, I, I said this yesterday, or not yesterday, time flies, huh? Um, it was a week ago at church on Sunday, I shared with you about a book study that we're going to be starting next week. Um, I apologize, I had two people show up today, and I don't think I was 100% clear on Monday night about that, um, that it didn't start today, it starts next week. Um, but we're going to be reading a book together, and it's called The Very Good Gospel, how Everything Wrong Can Be Made Right, and it is by an author named Lisa Sharon Harper, and this is a wonderful book uh, that really tries to get at what the, what the gospel really is. You know, I had someone recently uh, ask me that question, like, what is the gospel? And, and I had to pause for a moment and think about it, you know? I had to think about what is the gospel? Um, if I had to describe it to someone, how would I do that? You know, I think growing up, there was a very specific way People describe the gospel that, you know, we, we give our lives to Jesus, we're saved from our sins, and we get to be in heaven forever, you know? And, and that's part of it, but I think what Lisa Sharon Harper is trying to point out is that it's much more holistic than that, that, that the gospel has implications for the entire world and really has implications for the way that we live our lives right now in the here and now. And so this book is going to help be a kind of guide for us and a, a spark for us to, to get into some conversation about what the gospel is and what like a holistic gospel really looks like. And, and what do we as Christians, how do we share that gospel with other people? And so I encourage you all to come to the class. It will be next Sunday is when it starts. It will be at 9 a.m. before church in our chapel. And our chapel is right over here. When you come in these doors over here, it's right there on the left when you come in. And we'll be in the chapel. And I have books here this morning. So if you would like a copy, I'm asking that you give $10 to buy one. If you cannot afford one, just come tell me, I need one but don't have the money, and I'll just give it to you for free, all right? So um, I don't want this to be a hindrance for anybody. We actually had some folks give extra um, so that others who couldn't afford one could have one. So um, it will be no problem at all. But come see me after church. I have quite a few of them. I'd love to give you one. And Rachel, I think we have sign-up sheets, right? So there are sign-up sheets on each welcome table. So please, 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 when you leave, sign your name on that and put your email if you're going to participate because I need to send out some information, um, the Zoom link if you can't come in person because um, we are going to do it online also. All right? Let me know if you have any questions. You can also talk to Christina or Rachel as well, and we'll be sure to uh, answer any questions you have about that class. But that will be starting next week, and it will run for five weeks. Sound good? All right, I'm going to transition back here to my guitar because we're going to sing a song um, for our prayer time today.
I did want to say just a couple of words about this song before we sing it. You know, we've been in this series in the Sermon on the Mount, and we've been looking at all these teachings of Jesus. Uh, some of them are quite hard, you know, to accept at times because Jesus is offering a very countercultural, otherworldly kind of way to live in this world. And I believe Jesus is inviting us to, the, to life and to joy and to peace, and, and he's inviting us into something beautiful, but it still is not easy. It's not easy to bring the peace of God's kingdom into our communities. It's not easy to choose love when there's so much hate around us. It's not easy to reach out um, to those who are different than us when we feel threatened by them. And, and Jesus is still inviting us into this new way of being in this world. And I know many of you are trying in your daily lives to live out the example of Jesus, to follow in his way. And for me, like, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I want to give up. Sometimes I'm like, what am I doing? Like, I don't see any change. I just see things continue, the same cycles repeating in my own life and in our communities. And, and this song is called Your Labor is Not in Vain. And it's really a song from God's perspective, speaking and singing these words over us, reminding you that what you're doing, these small ways that you're trying to follow Jesus each and every day, they matter. And that God sees them and that these seeds that we're planting one day will grow and they will bear fruit. And we may not see the fruit of our labor, even in this lifetime. But God promises if those who are faithful, that we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And, and so we just wanted to sing this song to you um, during our time of prayer. And so you can just let these words wash over you. And, and maybe you need to hear these words. I, John Epley told me this morning the song was for me. And I said, yeah, I know. That's why I chose it, because I needed to hear these words. Um, I needed to hear these words that God is with me. He's called me by name. And that what we're doing here, this trying to live and follow the way of Christ is not a waste of time, that it will bear fruit, and that God is with us in the midst of all of this. Your labor is not in vain, though the ground underneath you is cursed and stained. Your planting and reaping are never the same. Your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not unknown. Though the rocks, they cry out and the sea, it may groan. The place of your toil may not seem like a home. Your labor is not unknown, for I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, for I have called you, called you by name, your labor. you plant will bear fruit. The fields will sing out and rejoice with the truth. For all that is old will at last be made new. The vineyards you plant will bear fruit. For I am Bye. 
you by name for I have called you called you by name for I have called you called you by name your labor is not in vain Amen Amen I invite you all to bow your heads with me just for a moment God, we thank you so much for this time we get to spend together. We thank you for the ways that you are speaking to our hearts. We thank you, Lord, that you see us when we feel unseen. We thank you, Lord, that you see our grief. We thank you that you see our pain. We thank you that you see these kind of small, like feeble attempts at love, but you see us, and, and God, we know that, that you're often proud of us because we are your children. And God, I pray, Lord, that, that, that we would rest in that this morning, that we would rest in that knowledge that we are your children and we are loved by you. God, we need you so, so much. God, we ask that you would be with us. As Christina shares this morning, we pray, Lord, that we would hear a word from you. That as she shares what is on her heart and what you have been doing in her life through our text for today, Lord, that, that the words from Scripture will come alive for us. And that we could imagine what, what these words mean for us in our own lives and in our communities and across our world. We pray we would leave here changed because we've encountered you. And now let's join together and pray this prayer that Jesus taught us, his disciples, to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thank you so much, John and the band, for leading us in that song. I love that it was the, the voice of God really speaking over us and to us this morning. I don't know about you, but sometimes that helps to soften my heart to know that I'm not just doing all the talking, but that he has something to say and I can listen to. And you know, we really believe that worship is a dialogue, that we come together on Sunday, not just to go through a routine, but to have a conversation with the, the God who made us. And so often we hear our own voices most, we sing and we talk to each other and we pray, but God is speaking to us, not just through that song this morning, but through scripture. We believe God is always actively speaking to us through scripture. So as we come to the text this morning, let us continue just to posture ourselves to listen. We've been in a series these last several weeks on the Sermon on the Mount, and this is our last week today in this series. And we're actually going to be talking about the very last passage of the Sermon on the Mount, that last closing statement that Jesus makes to, to kind of wrap it all up. And what better place for us to start than to talk about a hermeneutical principle? For those of you who know me or have talked to me much about scripture, you know that I'm a fan of hermeneutical principles. And if that is a term you do not know, let me just say it's a fancy way of talking about guidelines or ground rules to help us know that we are interpreting scripture faithfully. I like to keep them in mind in my own reading of scripture, and I like to throw them out every now and then as tools for your tool belt too, because you're also students of scripture, and I think they're helpful for us to talk about together. So I'm going to throw another one out there today. You guys ready? Okay, preference for the simplest, or sometimes people say clearest, interpretation. In other words, if there is a simple, clear, direct meaning, or a convoluted, highly spiritualized meaning, we would prefer the simpler one. That one is probably correct. This is an important principle for us to keep in mind when talking about the Sermon on the Mount as a whole. If you remember back to the very first week, John talked about how often the commands in the Sermon on the Mount are over-spiritualized to kind of water them down and make them a little bit more palatable, right? But in reality, in this sermon, even when what Jesus says is hard, it's incredibly practical. 
the simplest, clearest interpretation is best. He says what he means, and he means what he says. Often we get parables from Jesus, but this teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, a lot of it is very clear and very direct. So this week our passage, this final passage of the Sermon on the Mount, is no different. There's a very clear, direct interpretation. I read it the first time, and I went, hmm, well, that says something right there. I'm just reading it. And I actually think we can sum it up with a popular marketing catchphrase. So my recently retired dad was a marketing and advertising executive and professor his whole career. So this popped into my head in honor of him. And so we're going to flash up the logo, and you guys just tell me the tagline. Just do it. Yeah. All these things that Jesus has been saying in the Sermon on the Mount, just do them. (laughs) That's pretty much as simple as the first reading of this passage was for me this week. It's very clear, very direct. We're going to dive more into that today, but that's a good place to start. I want to read the passage for us and see if you hear the just do it as clearly as I did. This is Matthew 7, 24 through 29. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. The word of God for the people of God. Yes, so the wise man with a good final outcome hears and puts into practice. The foolish man, with a bad final outcome, hears and doesn't put into practice. Pretty clear, right? Just do it. Hear it and put it into practice. Well, I don't know about you, but this sort of directness is both refreshing and frustrating to me. I appreciate that Jesus wraps it all up with such a clear final imperative. But it's often a little bit frustrating to me when I walk away from a passage of scripture and I feel like there's a heavy impetus on me. Now, I have to summon up the energy to just do all the things, all the really challenging uh, transformative initiatives that Jesus has been offering up in this Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, don't you know that this is a really costly calling? Don't you know that this is hard? Don't you know that I'm already tired? Does anybody else feel me there? Well, I have learned that when I am frustrated by a scripture or exhausted at the idea of a scripture, that that usually means I need to take a step back and look at the bigger picture and get to the heart of the matter. John's been talking through this whole sermon series about how Jesus radicalizes or gets to the root of the laws of the Old Testament. He gets in there and figures out what really matters. Well, this morning, we're going to get to the heart of the matter as well and figure out the purpose behind this final command from Jesus. Why are we called to hear and obey? What is the undertone underneath the just do it? What's the purpose there? Well, I believe the answer to that question is in today's passage and in a couple others that are connected to it throughout the witness of Scripture. And that is one of Matthew's main points for us today, by the way that Jesus' words are connected to the whole witness of Scripture. His words stand in the same tradition, and they fulfill it. Back towards the beginning of the sermon, Jesus said this about himself in Matthew 5, 19. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, at the close of the sermon, Jesus' words don't sound quite like that. They don't seem as direct to us. But he's actually reinforcing that same idea. He's communicating again his own fulfillment of the law. He admonishes the crowds not just to hear his words, but to obey them. And when he does that, he's borrowing language that shows up over and over again in the Old Testament, specifically to talk about the very words of God. In the Old Testament, when God gives commands, when Moses, as the mouthpiece of God, gives the commands, over and over again, it says, hear and obey. 
It's the weighty matters of the law that you must hear and obey. So I want to show us a few examples from the book of Deuteronomy. At the opening of the Ten Commandments, pretty big deal. We hear in Deuteronomy 5.1, Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, O Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. Then also in Deuteronomy 8.1, we hear a similar sentiment with a statement of reasoning attached to it. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today or that you're hearing today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your fathers. So hear and follow the commands so that you can have the good outcome that you desire and that God desires for you. Then later, towards the very end of the book of Deuteronomy, in 28.1, we read this. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands, all these blessings will come upon you. And then there's a list of really great favorable outcomes. After that list of blessings comes this statement. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you. And so follows a list of undesirable outcomes. Okay, so all throughout the book of Deuteronomy, we hear this structure. And the structure of these phrases sounds a whole lot like the way Jesus has structured his closing statement, his wrap it up all together statement of the Sermon on the Mount. Hear my words and put them into practice. If you do, there's a good outcome, like the wise builder whose house stands. If you hear them and you don't put them into practice, there's a bad outcome, like the foolish builder whose house falls. That structure is very intentional. And it would have really jumped out to Jesus' Jewish listeners and to Matthew's Jewish readers. The audience would be quite clear about the fact that Jesus is equating his words with the words of the law, with the weight of the law. What he is suggesting is that they carry the same authority, that's a big deal, that they carry the same weight, and that just like the words of the law could bless or curse depending on how they took form in your life, Jesus' words can also bring life or death, blessing or curse depending on what we do with them. Now, no other Jewish rabbi would have ever <laughs> said something like this. That's why we get the closing phrases that we do, where it says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, that authority of the law, and not as their teachers of the law. So just by the way that he structures this closing statement in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes a statement about who he is, and people are hearing it. They're not missing it. They feel the authority when he's speaking this way. In the words of Jesus, the words and commands of God have been distilled, radicalized, and clarified. It's almost as if God is saying to his people, following the law hasn't been working so well for you, has it? Follow Jesus. Hear his words and build your life on his words the way that you see him build his life. You see, I think what's really powerful here that I don't want us to miss is that what God has wanted from his people the whole time is exactly the same as what he still wants when Jesus is speaking. He wants his people not just to hear his words, but to build their lives upon them. What he wants for his people, he's wanted it the whole time, and he still wants it, is exactly the same. He wants to bless his people, and he wants them to live full abundant lives. That's a beautiful thing that God wants for his people. And in today's passage, Jesus is talking about building houses to somehow communicate that to us. But in light of his words, we're meant to understand our act of construction as the building of our lives. We are meant to construct our lives on a lasting foundation. And that foundation he calls a rock. So just like he's already patterned his words to sound like the law, he calls himself a rock, and that also is Old Testament language. Over and over throughout the Old Testament in the Psalms and the prophets in multiple places, God is called a rock or even the rock of Israel. So this is recognizable language. Jesus is making a big statement here. His words carry the weight of the law. He himself 
is the rock that Israel needs to build their life upon. So what he's calling us to in this passage is a continual listening to and building our lives upon what he himself has said. That life then will be full and sturdy and lasting. Friends, the natural outcome of a life built on Jesus is the very abundant life Jesus promises. They go hand in hand. So though the words of the Sermon on the Mount are challenging, and though what we are called to is difficult, Jesus wants us to know that this way, this path, leads to life. When you take his words into your ears, and they make a home in your body, and you use that body to construct a life built on and shaped by his words, then you are able to withstand the storms that come. We've heard a lot of storm imagery and metaphors, haven't we? They show up in songs and poems and other forms of art. Maybe even in your conversations, your reflective conversations, you talk about your trials as a storm, right? That is familiar language to us. And we all have different storms at different seasons. Maybe your storm is chronic illness. Maybe it's divorce. Maybe it's financial insecurity or infertility. Maybe it's addiction, maybe your own or a family member's. Maybe you're feeling incredibly abandoned and lonely. Surely, a life built on Jesus is meant to withstand all of those storms. But more above and beyond that, today, scholars want us to know that this particular passage, these particular storms, are actually referencing an end final judgment kind of image. And we'll see that that shows up in scripture too. But really the question of this passage where the whole sermon has been building is in the end, will the life we have built stand before God or will it fall apart? Does that feel like a weighty question to anyone else? Feels like a big thing that we're dealing with today. Will the final test of our lives reveal that we have built them on a solid foundation or that we've built on an inferior foundation with inferior supplies? That's the question this passage asks us today. And the idea of storms depicting judgment is not new. It shows up in other places throughout scripture. But there's one especially helpful passage in the Old Testament that actually talks about storms taking down a poorly constructed wall. So it's a very similar image here to what we have in our passage. So let's hear Ezekiel 13, 8 through 14 now. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Because of your false words and lying visions, I am against you, declares the sovereign Lord. Because they lead my people astray, saying, peace, when there is no peace. And because when a flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash. Therefore, tell those who cover it with whitewash that it is going to fall. Rain will come in torrents, and I will send hailstones hurtling down, and violent winds will burst forth. When the wall collapses, will people not ask you, where is the whitewash you covered it with? Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In my wrath, I will unleash a violent wind, and in my anger, hailstones and torrents of rain will fall with destructive fury. I will tear down the wall you have covered with whitewash, and will level it to the ground so that its foundation will be laid bare. When it falls, you will be destroyed in it, and you will know that I am the Lord. Who needs a breather after that one? Well, that's some pretty strong language, right? The air of judgment is really clear in this passage. We've even got the word wrath in there, which makes plenty of us uncomfortable. But that wrath and that judgment in this passage, did you notice where it's directed? At false prophets with a particular kind of message. What these storms are doing, this judgment in this passage, God is holding accountable prophets who are proclaiming that there is peace, or that beautiful Hebrew word shalom, when there is not. He likens their prophecies to a flimsy wall that has been whitewashed or cleaned up and covered up to hide what it really is. So when the storms of God's judgment come, the true nature of the wall is revealed. It is leveled to the ground, and the foundation is laid bare so that people can see it was not going to stand in the first place. In both passages, this Ezekiel one and the teaching at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, there's a problem with the foundation. 
and therefore the construction leads to destruction. In the Ezekiel passage, the foundation upon which this flimsy wall has been built is the lie that shalom is present when it is not. Let's just take a moment to remember what shalom is. It's a word we talk about a lot here at Embrace, but it's more than a word. It's a picture. It's something I want us to be able to hold on to. So shalom is a godly peace. It's not just an absence of conflict, but a fullness of life and wholeness and thriving. It's enoughness for all people and the ability to live at peace and in communion with one another and God. Shalom is life and life to the full for all people. So when these prophets are saying this shalom exists in Israel and it really doesn't, what's happening is that the people in power with a voice are proclaiming lies to cover up what's really going on. We read all throughout the prophets that God is judging Israel for their treatment of the poor. There might be some people who are living a good life in Israel, but a lot of them are not. That is not a picture of shalom. And so God is holding accountable those who have said this peace is there when it is not. And I want us to notice what these storms of judgment tell us. They tell us how incredibly important true shalom is, actual shalom, to God and to his vision for his people. So we've already established that God wants a good, full, thriving life for all of us. But it's more than that. God wants that thriving and that fullness and that everyone has enoughness for all people, for all of creation, in fact. So when we put the insights of the Ezekiel passage next to the passage from the Sermon on the Mount, which is another hermeneutical principle, scripture interprets scripture, then we actually have an insight not just about construction and and how to build things, but an insight about what the purpose is behind Jesus telling us to hear and obey hear and put his words into practice. Simply, it's because only the house or the life built on Jesus constructs true shalom. Foolish, lying, and deceived people might believe that they're building the good life, but built on anything other than Jesus and his way, it's not the best life, which is shalom for all people. Do you see it? All these challenging words in the Sermon on the Mount, do you see what Jesus is doing? He's telling us what it looks like practically. How many of us are always like, give me something practical? He's telling us the practical pieces of working for and living inside shalom with one another. Let's go back to the studies that we've already done, the passages we've already looked at, and see if we can see them with a shalom-shaped lens. The first week, John preached a passage where Jesus radicalized a command about murder to show us that the heart of it was about treating people rightly, not doing anything that would deny their human worth and dignity. And the transforming initiative that week was to seek reconciliation. And those reconciled relationships would then point towards the communion that God intends for us at the heart of this picture of shalom. The second week, John looked at a passage that challenged those who were experiencing persecution to use active, non-violent resistance to evil. The people who were seemingly without power were charged to take the transforming initiatives of asserting their own human dignity. Again, we see that concern for human dignity and that protection of people. And we see that really those transforming initiatives are a protest They're um, a statement that says the shalom of God transcends even human power abuse. The third week, John preached on the passage that invited us to do good works in secret. And we talked about how the heart of that was really about the condition of our hearts. Are we getting our worth and our value from God, or are we seeking affirmation other places? See, part of the picture of shalom is accepting our own worth, that we're made in the image of God, that he restores us and renews us and transforms us. Part of that enoughness is not just knowing that God gives us enough, but that he's made us enough. So the three passages we've studied together are able to show us a glimpse of shalom, but they're just a sampling of the different teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus also brings up other topics, including the Beatitudes, And for those of you who know these, these are all about the fortunes and the experiences of the poor and the dispossessed being reversed. 
It's all about their inheritance in the kingdom of God and a picture of the shalom that God intends. There's also teaching on adultery and divorce and love for enemies. And all of that points to the radical justice and mercy and right treatment of the other that is central to the picture of shalom. There's also commands not to worry because of the sufficiency and the enoughness available in God. And this is the teaching that if we would keep it in mind every single day, we would learn not to worry. We would learn to live in the shalom that God provides for us. So over and over again throughout the Sermon on the Mount, we realize that the words Jesus says point out what stands in the way of shalom and transforms our ability to experience shalom if we will just put them into practice. Why? Why is it so important that we hear and put into practice? Because building our lives by following the way of Jesus is how shalom breaks into the world starting in our lives and the lives that touch ours and rippling out from there. This is a beautiful vision that Jesus is casting in the Sermon on the Mount. Though sometimes following him feels really costly, what he is inviting us into is so much richer than we have imagined. It's so much more expansive. It's so much deeper and more beautiful. That shalom for all people. It transforms not only our own lives, but our whole communities when we hear and we put into practice. I want to make just one last observation about the metaphor that Jesus develops in this close of the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about the foundation of the wise man's house and the foolish man's house. So the wise man builds on rock, and the foolish man builds on sand. Did you guys know that sand is just a bunch of really tiny rock particles? I've told you before I'm not a science person, so... I Googled this. I think it's still true. <laughs> Maybe check with Chuck if it's not. Um, but I think it's possible that over time, with enough erosion, a rock can be broken down into sand. And so what that says to me is that if we try to break down these very challenging teachings of Jesus to maybe pick just what's most palatable to us, we end up compromising the integrity of our foundation. Jesus isn't calling us just to listen to some of his words and put them into practice. He's calling us to build our whole lives on everything he has said. And I know, keeping in mind and living out all of the transforming initiatives Jesus has offered in this sermon sounds nothing short of overwhelming, if we're honest. But again, it's about the heart of the matter, right? And this morning we've seen that the heart of the matter is shalom. And so I think we can ask ourselves just a couple of questions to really help us live into the whole teaching of Jesus and build our lives on that. Does the choice I am making contribute to or inhibit my ability or another's ability to experience God's shalom? What is the action or choice that allows shalom to break in? I think as we sit with those questions this morning, if we learn to ask ourselves those questions on a regular basis, as we interact with people, as we face hard decisions, I think maybe we'll take a little bit of growth, and I think we will be able to build that house uh, one brick at a time and find that it is on a solid foundation. And though today's passage does not mention the Holy Spirit, I have to wind up there. I would be doing us a disservice if I did not mention that this hearing and putting into practice all the words of Jesus is empowered for us by the very spirit of Jesus himself. See, we don't just build our lives on Jesus. We build our lives with Jesus. That means the spirit helps us to discern, helps us to answer that question. What choice or action allows shalom to break in? And then the spirit gives us the power, actual power, to make that choice or take that action. So though we began today by noting the challenge and the cost of putting into practice all these words of Jesus, we've discovered that there is a purpose that leads to a powerful kind of life for all of us. The call of Jesus is still challenging, but it's the way of God's shalom breaking into the world. And all the power that we need to walk this way is already ours by the Spirit of Christ Jesus who dwells 
in us. So there's purpose and there's power in what Jesus has commanded us to do here at the close of the Sermon on the Mount. So let us hear and obey and take heart. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Transition into a time of taking communion together this morning. If you did not get a communion cup when you came in, they are still available um, at the welcome table. There's a basket in the back. Feel free just to get up and grab one, or I think you could probably lift your hand if you need one, and a friend can grab it for you. But we're going to take this communion meal together like we do every week. We're going to be reminded that Jesus has already done all of the hard work he calls us to. There is nothing Jesus calls us to that he has not already done for us, that he will not empower in us. And taking communion every week is a reminder of that. It is an opportunity for us to together choose again to accept Jesus' work in our lives, choose again to say, yes, I will take his power into myself and I will live the way of Jesus. And so this is an action that we take that I believe allows shalom to begin breaking in to our lives and the lives that touch ours and rippling out from there. So I just want to invite us this morning just to take a few moments of silence to really center ourselves as we prepare to take communion. And as you think, as you spend the, some moments in silence here, I just invite you to really ask the Lord just to give you the power and the strength that you need in this coming week to be able to put his words into practice. Maybe you know there's a particular instruction you've really been avoiding, and you can confess that right now in this time. But whatever he wants to do in our hearts this morning, let's give him space just to speak to us this morning. God, we confess together today that we have often decided to pick and choose the words of yours that we want to put into practice. And even those we've not always put into practice well, certainly not with our whole hearts. We praise you, Lord, that today you offer us forgiveness. And that you don't just forgive us and move on, but that you forgive us and you fill us with the power to walk the way of Jesus afresh and anew. God, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these common elements, these gifts of bread and juice, and that you would allow them to be for us the body and blood of Christ, that as we share this communion feast together, we might be transformed and empowered to seek you and to serve you and to live in the way of Jesus out in the midst of a weary and waiting world. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you'd like to go ahead and take the bread with me. This is the body of Christ broken for you.
And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. We're going to have one more song, just a little bit more space to worship this morning. This altar is always open to you. You're welcome to come and pray up here if you would like. I'll hang around, and if you want me to pray with you, just let me know, or I'll give you space if you want that. There's also, I think, someone available to pray with you at the back of the sanctuary as well. Um, But let's just take a few moments to worship together. Could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, oh, we live for you.
you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Well, it's really good to be together today, and I pray that God did something in your heart, in your life today, and I, my hope is that we leave here feeling confident that what Jesus has invited us into is beautiful, and it is good, and it is right, and it will truly ultimately lead to uh, peace and, and what we're searching for here in our lives and in our world. So if y'all prepare your hearts for the benediction, may the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Go in God's peace.